Hi there, my name is Bruce and welcome to our second lesson in this series. In this lesson, we will look at the relationship between solubility and temperature. We already know that a chemical reaction exists between a solute and a solvent to make up a solution. However, is energy absorbed or released in this process? What effect does temperature have on the dissolving process? In order to answer these questions, I will show you experiments, record data and make conclusions based on this data. We will also examine data collected by scientists and learn how to interpret data represented on a graph. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to perform an experiment to show if energy is released or absorbed when a salt dissolves in water, explain what a saturated solution is, and use data to predict and analyze the solubility of salts at different temperatures. In this lesson, we will look at an experiment that will show you that not all solutes dissolve in exactly the same way. Let us now look at the apparatus that we will need for this investigation. We will need two beakers into which I will add 100 milliliters of water. Water is the solvent in this experiment. Notice that the volume of solvent used in both beakers is the same. This ensures that the test is fair. You will also need the same mass of two different solutes, sodium hydroxide and ammonium chloride. A thermometer is used to see if there is a temperature change when the solute dissolves in the solvent. Now you can see that the experiment has been designed fairly. The independent variable is the type of solute used, while the dependent variable will be our temperature change. Now let's draw up a table to record our results. Whenever you carry out an experiment, make sure that you draw up a table to record your results before actually doing the experiment. Here you can see we need to record the initial temperature before adding the solute and the final temperature is the temperature of the solution after all the solute has dissolved. First, you need to measure the temperature of the solvent before adding the solute and have recorded the readings in a table. The temperature of the solvent is 26 degrees Celsius. Now, I will add the sodium hydroxide to the beaker and stir with the glass rod until all the solute has dissolved. Let's check the temperature now and record it. The final temperature is 33,5 degrees Celsius. We can now calculate the change in temperature by subtracting the initial temperature from the final temperature. The change in temperature is plus 7,5 degrees Celsius. Did you notice that the temperature increased when the solute was added to the solvent? In other words, energy was released in the form of heat during this process. This is a special type of reaction known as an exothermic reaction. Here is a definition for it. A chemical reaction is exothermic if more energy is released than absorbed during the reaction. The energy is most often released in the form of heat and light. The question is, is heat energy always released when a solute dissolves in a solvent? Let's see what happens with our other solute. We now add ammonium chloride to the water and stir the solution with a glass rod. The solute has all dissolved. 
What is the final temperature? The final temperature is 20,5 degrees Celsius. So in this case, the change in temperature is minus 5,5 degrees Celsius. Now, did that surprise you? Can you see that not all solutions are able to release heat energy when they are formed? The temperature decreased when the solute was added. The reason for this decrease in temperature is that the solution absorbs energy from the surrounding environment. This is known as an endothermic reaction. A chemical reaction is endothermic if more energy is absorbed than released during the reaction. Endothermic chemical reactions often require large amounts of heat to get started. But what happens if we change another variable? For example, the mass of the solute. Let's look at another experiment. In this experiment, we will continue to add the same solute, namely copper sulfate, to 25 milliliters of solvent. We weighed out these samples of solute, and the samples have the same mass of one gram. Each time we add one gram of solute to the solvent, we need to stir the solution formed until all the solute has dissolved. Remember to record the temperature after each addition. What are the independent and dependent variables in this experiment? This time, the mass of the solute is the independent variable and the temperature is the dependent variable. As always, we need a table to record our results. This is how my table would look. Right, let's look at the experiment. Notice that the color of the solvent changes when I add the solute to it. Now, why do you think this is so? Well, the blue solution formed is due to the presence of copper 2 plus ions. We need to repeat the same procedure each time and make sure that the solute has dissolved completely before taking the temperature reading. Before I analyze the results of this investigation, there are some important observations that I would like you to take note of. These observations will allow us to define some new terminology and in so doing, build up our science vocabulary. Did you notice that when a small sample of solute was added to the solvent, it dissolved quickly without much stirring. Did you also notice that the solution formed was a very pale blue color? This type of solution is called a dilute solution. A dilute solution has a small amount of solute compared to the amount of solvent. Do you notice that as more solute is added, the blue color becomes darker? This is called a concentrated solution. A concentrated solution has a large amount of solute compared to the amount of solvent. Now, as the solution became more concentrated, did you notice that it was taking longer for all the solute to dissolve into the solvent compared to our very first dilute solution? If this is true, then there must be a point at which no more solute can dissolve into the solvent at that particular temperature. Here is the beaker which contained 25 milliliters of water at the beginning of the experiment. We have added 12 grams of solute to it. The last sample of solute just does not want to dissolve at this temperature. This means that this is now a saturated solution. A saturated solution is a solution in which no more solute will dissolve at the present temperature of the solution. The terms dilute solution, concentrated solution, and saturated solution are all extremely important. Make sure that you understand what they mean. Now let's try and analyze the results from our experiment. Can you see that the temperature has changed each time some solute was added to the solvent? An endothermic reaction is taking place since the temperature 
is decreasing. To get a better understanding of the relationship between mass of solute and temperature, I will now plot this data onto a graph. From this graph, we can see that there is a relationship between mass of solute dissolved and the temperature of the solution. This graph raises one more question. Can we change the solubility of a saturated solution by changing the temperature? Let's see what happens. We are now heating the saturated solution. Notice that more solute starts to dissolve. This solution is now called supersaturated. At this high temperature, we can place some more solute in the form of a copper sulfate crystal into the solution and then allow the solution to cool. I will show you what happens if I leave it for a couple of days. This is a very simple experiment that you can also try to do. If you can't get any copper sulfate from the pharmacy, why don't you try some table salt, Epsom salts, or even sugar? Now let's look at what happened to our supersaturated solution. The solvent has evaporated and the solute has formed crystals. This process is called crystallization. Now our final task for today is to look at a solubility curve. There are some interesting observations you can make by looking at this graph. Can you see that each of the solutes behaves differently? Do you notice that sodium chloride solubility hardly changes as the temperature increases? But potassium chloride solubility increases steadily as the temperature increases. The graph is a straight line. Next, did you notice that at 0 degrees Celsius, sodium chloride was the most soluble, then potassium chloride, copper sulfate, and lastly, potassium sulfate. Does this order change as temperature increases? For example, what will be the order of solubilities at 60 degrees Celsius and at 80 degrees Celsius? At 60 degrees Celsius, the most soluble is potassium chloride, followed by sodium chloride, copper sulfate, and the least soluble is potassium sulfate. At 80 degrees Celsius, we find that the most soluble is now copper sulfate, followed by potassium chloride, then sodium chloride, and still the least soluble, potassium sulfate. Well, I'm sure you will agree that we've really established some interesting relationships between temperature and solubility. Please join me next time, where in our third lesson, we'll be looking at the solubility rules. Until then, thank you and goodbye.